Hello everyone, Steve Vegliante. I am standing behind Town Hall today. Uh, I wanted to interview a couple of people that are leaders in our community and the, they have, they perform very different roles, but they're also married. And I thought they would add a perspective that we haven't seen in quite some, we haven't seen at least in the town of Fallsburg locally uh, on Facebook and social media. And I think it's important to, uh, and it's a perspective I think that's important uh, on two different levels. Um, so I'm going to turn the camera around in a minute and we're going to meet Rabbi uh, Lawrence Zeeler and his wife, R Bernie Zeeler. Uh, hold on one second. Let me... Okay, here we are. This is R uh, Rabbi Lawrence Zeeler and Bernie Zeeler, his wife. Uh, Bernie, can you tell us what you do and where you do it? I'm a physician assistant and for 10 months of the year, I'm the solo practitioner at the Rafua Health Center on... 36 Laurel Avenue here in South Fallsburg. For those of you that don't know, the Rafua Health Center is the medical officer for the town of Fallsburg. We have to pick a medical officer every year and they serve that duty for us. And they are a non nonprofit. Correct. Um, they provide med basic and advanced medical services to at risk communities. Correct? That's right. Correct. We are federally certified health uh, practice and we also are considered to be a uh, home uh, family practice home for people so our preference uh, we do do urgent care but our preference is for people to uh, become part of the practice so that we can help them not only when they're ill but to provide preventative care so that they do not become ill so now, Rufu is based in South Fallsburg, but they also have a mobile component? Yes, so actually we're a satellite of the main office down in Spring Valley, New York, which is in Rockland County. Uh, and they started up here, actually was the origination of the Rufua program, of, out of concern for summer visitors who were going two, three months without medical care and uh, the actually began with the mobile component. There are five mobile health units uh, that go out mostly only in the summer. There have been uh, exceptions to that. And in fact, there are two additional mobiles uh, being created as we speak out in Indiana uh, that will be delivered sometime in the next few months. That, that's great. So I know you said that it was orig they originally came up to deal mostly with the Orthodox community. Is that really how it how it ended? <laughs> I no, mean, right. That was uh, it. Was originally they were going to see. Actually, it was a venture uh, of two cousins, and they wanted to see if they could make a profit uh, off off of mobile health and see if they could service the people in the summer. Uh, it was not profitable, but the younger of the cousins, the 19 year old, decided that it was so important that she would continue the work, whether there was a profit or not. And she today, uh, Connie Sternberg, is the CEO of the entire company and it is all non-for-profit and it services all people, all walks and faiths and creeds and colors uh, in throughout uh, Rockland County and here in Sullivan County. I kind of brought that up in a leading question sort of way. I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I, I fall into that practice once in a while. And the reason I brought it up is because based on the location in Fallsburg primarily, uh, I think what has happened is it's become a real benefit to our, um, our, our indigent community and our, our migrant community. We have workers that, that live in and around the Rafua buildings that really have no other access to quality health care and Rafua's location there and stepping into that our community has really benefited that are our, our most at risk. So I, I've had a lot of dealings over the years with, with Mrs. Sternberg and I just I'm really grateful that they decided to be here. So and I'm really glad that they hired you and you're part of the team there because having local uh, having a local professional that's so invested in our community has really shown real benefits. So if I could ask you to maybe talk about COVID-19, the coronavirus, its impact and what you've been seeing. So for the most part, uh, I see a um, huge swath of the community, including recently our um, folks 
that are usually only seasonal but have come up to shelter in their second homes. So many of them have come up from Brooklyn. And my anecdotally, I can say that those folks have already been impacted uh, by COVID-19. Um, there was uh, a large gathering across the Jewish community back in the uh, 10th of March for the holiday of Purim. The rules had not come down yet uh, fully about social distancing. There was discussion about it and the um, infection ha was widespread enough that many, many people in those communities uh, became infected and within that week, so middle of March, many of them were infected. I would say probably about 50% of those um, urban communities where they live cheek to jowl. And that's what I'm hearing from people as they call and I filter them because I myself don't want to get sick. I filter them to find out if they're experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. And they're all telling me that, oh, I already had that. I had that last month. Locally, I'm uh, only seeing, again, anecdotally, I'm only seeing COVID-19 affecting our essential workers. So those of you out there who are not considered essential workers, I commend you on having doing the right thing and isolating because I'm not seeing very many of you coming to me with these complaints of the symptoms uh, that would tell me that you're possibly at risk that you've caught the COVID-19. I think that brings up a, you know something we try to drive home. I, I do it in almost every one of these messages or any messages I give. If you're not an essential worker, please stay home because we need our essential workers, all our town workers, our firemen, our police, our medical workers, such as Mrs. Zeeler here. And when they, if they go down, who will be there to take care of, uh, of the, of, of all of us? And you know, one of the, I'm glad to hear you say that you're not seeing the general population as much. And hopefully, if we're all staying home, we're let, we're putting essential workers less at risk. And you're hopefully you're seeing those numbers start to come down. That's correct. Good. All right, I'm going to shift over to Rabbi Zeeler. And um, Rabbi, I got an early view of uh, your op-ed op that'll be in today's uh, River Reporter. And I just want to thank you for being that moderate voice, that uh, informative voice, a very calming voice, um, and what you're seeing in our community, both Orthodox and secular. And I was hoping you kind of could talk about it. We will be printing your op-ed on our, uh, we'll be publishing it on our website and on our Facebook page with the permission of the River Reporter. Uh, today as well. So what I'm trying to do is uh, separate fact from fiction, give people a certain sense of comfort in the decisions that they have to make about their religious obligations. I think it's lo um, praiseworthy that people want to assemble uh, and from the observant community and services, but at the same time, we have a very strong tradition that overrides our religious obligations for the sake of preserving life. And right now, that's job one, is for us to be able to see to it that everyone is in a safe place. We will restore our sense of communal gathering, but right now it really needs to be on hold. And these are not subjective decisions. They come from objective sources uh, in Jewish law that require us to um, guard and protect our lives. And also to be mindful of the fact that we don't live for ourselves. We live for community. Uh, and. Uh, that's a very strong value, I would say Judeo-Christian value. I'd like to think that my sentiments, what I have expressed coming from our tradition, our Jewish tradition, isn't exclusive uh, to uh, our Jewish community, but it also um, inspires and comes forth from uh, the uh, social uh, gospel or what you call ethical monotheism. Uh, that is uh, the joining force of the common denominator uh, for from all our faith communities. So um, I want to at least start with our, our own community and uh, give them the support and the confidence to be able to stay at home and find meaning in, in prayer and other home-based rituals. Passover is a good example, even though it had to uh, be uh, radically altered in terms of the number of people around the Passover Seder. but 
it's a home-based ritual. People were able to hunker down and, and, and observe the rituals um, and to come out uh, the whole nature of, of, of assembly in any religious community means that uh, people are close to each other. So we have to develop new ways, new means by which we can feel intimacy from afar. And um, Judaism and Jewish law is uh, organic and it's developing. Even though we operate from precedence and from immutable principles, uh, but when it comes to health and wellness, that's probably one of the most innovative and one of the more encouraging aspects of our religious lifestyle is that we are not silent to the issues of the day. We have wisdom. So um, I've tried uh, to unearth some of that so that we can um, encourage and secure the community to do the right thing. And it is short-sighted uh, for people to come together uh, and ignore the long-term picture. Um, there is a nice, uh, a very important quality to, to praying together, but at the same time, um, not at the expense of, um, of uh, other people's lives. There's a Hebrew expression which I'll translate, chamira sakanta miisura, that sakana, danger, is much more of a concern than perhaps you're violating uh, a, a religious law. And as I said in my article, people, uh, when it comes to the, 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 um, the Sabbath laws, which we are, have license to ignore in situations of peril and, and illness, um, it comes from a very good place. Better to, uh, uh, to violate one Sabbath so that you'll be able to have many more um, in the future. So I, I, I had read a, uh, a statement from a prominent rabbi in Israel and the, you know, it was, I read obviously the transliteration of it and what it had said, it, it, the, the meaning behind it, well, the essential uh, meaning of it was if we say, it, if, if no one were to practice Shabbos and it saved one life, it would be fully worth it. Right. And I, 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 it really kind of struck me because we've all seen uh, on Facebook of you know Orthodox gatherings and things, and I think you know timing of them. I think many of them again happened earlier in this process. I, I, I'm, you know, we have many many different sects and many many uh, different Orthodox groups as part of our family here in Fallsburg, but I think almost to the to the group, I, I'm seeing directives coming from the leaders of each sect to do exactly what you just said and suspend any group activities until this is over to protect the lives of not only their members, but our community as a whole. Is it fair to say that you're seeing the same thing across our Orthodox uh, neighbors? Well, uh, Jewish law, it could, you could say in, in these situations is a monolith, you know, that it takes, it's pretty straight and, and pretty direct and, and clear in terms of what must be. Um, leadership will, uh, make prudent statements and they have unfortunately uh, the people are not a monolith and so there are people who sometimes feel that well we'll make our own adjustments and uh, as they say make Shabbos for myself uh, and and that's wrong this is a time when we really have to toe a common line and uh, so there I, I I think we have to I'm saying this only because if anyone has the inclination to um, or a group of people feel that you know, they might be able to sidestep it and and practice what they consider to be good measures of safety. This is a case where you cannot cut any corners. Uh, and I, I implore of, of uh, my co-religionists from all uh, the different inclinations within orthodoxy. Uh, I am a, an orthodox rabbi who's trained academically as well as religiously. So I have med a medical background having worked in hospitals and having a degree in, in medical decision-making and bioethics. And so therefore I might come from a different perspective, but my perspective is not at odds with the law. Um, it, it maybe is enhanced by my uh, other training. And I say to uh, anyone out there who thinks that they might be able to tweak it, this is a time when you really have to toe the line. We will get to a good place. We will appreciate our communities even more because we of what we have not been able to have in the way of communal celebrations. But right now, 
we have to find ways to bring the meaning we would find in the synagogue or in the study hall into our own homes. And um, just this morning when I was saying my morning prayers, uh, I add certain prayers. I add Psalm 121 uh, at the end of my silent devotion, which is, I will lift up my eyes to the heavens from whence will come my help. There are things that we can do. There, we have a vast amount of inspiration to pull on to, to, uh, in situations like this that can help us. And that's, I think, a better place to put our energies and for us to research and recover rather than the standard um, behaviors that we are used to. Things are askew. And um, halacha, Jewish law, was not made for a perfect society. It was, in fact, its grandeur and its greatness is the fact that it has answers for these kinds of situations that can preserve life. And that's, you know, I think I want to underscore that. Uh, draw, uh, be drawn or to those traditions that, and to the ongoing interpretive tradition of a living Judaism that gives us the wisdom to respond responsibly in situations such as these. I will say that, you know, the town and myself, we're all bound to follow the directions from the from the governor and the Department of Health. There is a chain of command. And that's how we're on a secular basis trying to protect everyone in town in the town of Fallsburg. And I believe this is like a war and, and we need to have leaders and we need to follow their direction. And I think what Rabbi Zeller has just said and what many, many religious leaders throughout our community and throughout the world have said is correct. And I think what we're saying to everyone, whether secular or religious, is follow these rules, follow these guidelines. And if, by the way, if you disagree with me, tell me. But well, if we follow these rules and we follow these guidelines, right. we're going to protect each other and ourselves. And we're going to, you know, and that's all that our religion, it's all our, uh, that our, our God and all our, our families will want from us, will need from us. And we need to be our, I guess we all need to be our brother's keeper. So I want to just add two things. My better half whispered something that I was thinking of just before, and that is that there's a ruling from the Talmud, which is normative, functional, uh, and that is in the name of the sage Shmuel, Samuel, who says, Dina de Malchuta Dina, the law of the land is the law. Now, there were times in history, and this is what confuses it, you read stories in the Talmud how uh, our communities were unfairly taxed and oppressed and so there were times when we had to step aside or work around these oppressive measures. We don't have that. We live in a just democratic society where fairness and equity are the rules of the day. So the law of the land is the law because there's nothing that in, in the laws that we have that works against anyone's rights for uh, full realization of their human potential and um, it's very important that when an edict comes down, it's not coming from a bad place. When the government says something, it's been carefully deliberated and considered. And so uh, if we need a sound bite out there, if I wanna give you something to my, my dear friends, uh, my co-religionists, Dina, de Malchuta Dina. Let's not forget something that we live by when we pay our taxes and when we are good citizens, um, we have to remind ourselves that that is our guiding light um, and that is uh, the hallmark and it especially stands true um, under these circumstances and uh, one should not in any way think that uh, that anyone is working against them um, you read things and people do these interpretive pieces that they sometimes think uh, are uh, intended for one community I can tell you in the five years we've been here I am um, we have found a tremendous amount of tolerance, wonderful relationships that cross over boundaries. Um, and I think that if we draw from the correct traditions and we exercise caution and patience, we're going to see that we will become strong at the broken places. I, I certainly hope so. Um, I just wanna, I'll, I'll end this with a profound thank you uh, to both of you. 
Uh, Rabbi Zeeler, you've shown yourself to be a leader in our community of calm voice in many, many situations. And uh, Mrs. Zeeler, you, you're on the front lines of, of this fight, and this is a fight that you know could could really put your you and your family at risk. So you have the town of Fallsburg's thanks, and, and my thanks for coming on today to, to add some calm and add some truth and add some hope to our to our overall conversation. So thank you very much. And if there's anything you both would like to add, uh, uh, this is- I just is... want everyone to know that we love living here. This is a good place. We want to make it better. And it's in moments of crisis that we discover some of our real talents. And uh, let's mine those talents uh, from the depths of our hearts and um, not necessarily see this as a time when anyone is being persecuted uh, by public policy, but we're actually, we are all being given the chance to refract through the lens of tradition, a way to deal with uh, difficulty and to rise to the occasion. Um, in the face of adversity, we prove ourselves. And um, it's a time when we can celebrate tradition it, by the means through which tradition helps us and holds us. Uh, the tradition is not, uh, is a great, um, the traditions of life preservation um, are extensive and we are not without answers. Uh, but what we have to do is again, separate the fact from fiction, be patient, the, uh, better times will come. Uh, in the meantime, we're showing um, our greatness and our goodness by following the dictates of faith that were designed to preserve life. So we can live by the mitzvot, by the commandments, and, and, not, and, not, be, and not die by them. Can I ask you one further question? Um, almost 600 people have been diagnosed with coronavirus and I'm, we've lost 14 souls. 14 of our neighbors, our friends, our family. To the people out there that have lost someone that are suffering, is there, is there a message we can say to them, you know, about the times to come in terms of those people who've lost loved ones um, it's very painful because of the fact that this uh, seems to be rather very random um, and um, I think um, what we need to do for those families is to stay in contact with them um, and to support them emotionally I say contact, not uh, virtual, uh, virtual contact. Um, we hope that there will be an end to it in sight. I unfortunately have been doing funerals uh, for victims. Um, unfortunately, this is an asymmetrical war uh, where we don't know the enemy. Uh, there's no uniform. There's nothing that we can actually identify. The droplets aren't actually wearing berets that we could actually shoot at them. And that makes it very frustrating. Uh, so, um, I, you know, one of the things that really helps people heal is presence. And we have to think hard. And I've been putting, uh, trying to uh, do mourners aftercare to reach out to people. Um, I think that we can't take back the pain that people have, but what we can do is affirm our love for them by being available to them and working overtime to see to it that their losses are not um, are insignificant. These are names, not numbers. Uh, I say that at every funeral. Um, every life has a name, a history, a background, a record of accomplishment. And we have to, uh, at some later date, so. do a better job of profiling these people so that we can ensconce in the annals of history and community uh, um, our community heritage, who these people were. Um, but I always worry about stale sorrow. And what I mean by that is that once you get so many people who die or you have so much tragedy, the person from last month is forgotten in the face of the person who's dying today. And that's something we have to work very hard about, uh, hard uh, to, um, uh, to prevent because the saddest thing is for a person to look around and say, I don't matter anymore. Uh, and so I think that uh, it, that is our op moral obligation because of the enormity of this, to see to it that these are names, not numbers. Their faces, not figures.
you and I, we're, we're, each of us, we're, we're wearing our masks, we're wearing our gloves. And I think we're all doing that because you're absolutely right. We all matter. Our friends, our family, our neighbors, they matter. And you know, we need to do the best we can to make sure that they're safe. Hey, I really appreciate you guys taking the time. We're free. It's also, by the way, very cold out here. So, and we had to do this outside. We have so warm hearts. We all, all right. We, we, if very I can say warm one hearts. more thing, I, sure, invite, please. I invite all the town of South Fallsburg to avail themselves of the health care that is taking place, again, at 36 Laurel Avenue. We are open during this pandemic. I'm the only practitioner, which means there's no reason for anybody to be sitting in a waiting room. So people are spaced apart accordingly and the facility is sanitized in between. We accept many forms of health, of health insurance and we have a sliding scale for those without health insurance. So we're here for you. We want to help. We're also doing phone encounters as well as telehealth encounters. So if you can't get out or don't want to get out, that's available for you as well. You can give us a call. Thank you so much, Rabbi, Mrs. Zeller. Thank you for all you do. God bless and thank you for what you do, Steve. I appreciate it. In this community, we appreciate it. You are a calming voice and uh, you really bring a, a tremendous amount of uh, hope to the community. It we'll is get through this together because of the fact that we're working together. Thank you so much for, for recognizing that. I appreciate it. It's all I can do is try, and that's what we're going to do throughout this. So thank you so much.